before we start, if you're enjoying these conversations, please make sure that you like or subscribe to Cleaning Up. It really helps other people to find us. Cleaning Up is brought to you by Capricorn Investment Group, the Liebreich Foundation, and the Gilardini Foundation. Hello, I'm Michael Liebreich, and this is Cleaning Up. My guest today has a 50-year history as a thought leader in energy. Nobuo Tanaka has, among other things, served as Director for Energy, Science and Technology at the OECD and as Executive Director for the International Energy Agency between 2007 and 2011. He's a leading voice for the return of the Japanese nuclear fleet to operation after the Fukushima disaster and also for Japan to have a net zero pathway. Please welcome Nobuo Tanaka to Cleaning Up. So Tanaka-san, thank you so much for joining us here on Cleaning Up. It's a, always an enormous pleasure to see you again. You're most welcome, Michael. I'm really delighted to come back and to have chat with you. This is a great opportunity. I really respect what you have done before, and I learned a lot from you. So this is a great revival of our meaning and our communication. Well, exactly. It's been too long since well before the uh, pandemic uh, that we last uh, met and interacted. What I'd like to do is, can we start, if I might, by asking you to give a thumbnail of your bio the short version, okay. because we have a, a an audience, we have a very diverse audience. Some will know you, some are mm -hmm. great old friends of both of ours, but there's also a lot of people who are perhaps relatively new to the energy sector. So give mm -hmm. the short version. Okay, well, after I graduated the University of Tokyo, I joined METI, Ministry of Trade and Industry. So I'm the you know career, uh, career industrial policy related government official by exercise. But uh, my Career is uh, you know staying outside of Japan. A half of my career is is abroad. So many of my colleagues back in many is calling me a foreigner, <laughs> and uh, you know once uh, twice in the Washington D.C. in the Japanese embassy trade war front with the United States semiconductor steel whatever, and then. Three times in Paris, twice in OECD, uh, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. I was the director in charge of science, technology, and industry, so industrial policy, technology policy. But uh, at the second time, uh, in 2007, I was uh, asked to go the candidacy for the running as a candidate for the executive director of the IEA. I was very luckily elected and uh, stayed in Paris four years more as an executive director of the IEA. I retired in 2011 and uh, working in coming back to Japan and, and making a kind of opinion leader in the energy security, sustainability in, in the University of Tokyo, IEEJ. And now I am working as the chairman of uh, Innovation for Cool Earth Forum, which you see here, which is, was created uh, 2014, I think, by the former prime minister, the late prime minister, Shinzo Abe, as a global uh, forum to get the uh, experts in the sustainability to talk about innovation, technology, new technologies, uh, or, or innovation for the policy itself sometimes. So we have annual meeting in Tokyo, and these two, three, uh, we are on the web and hybrid meeting. But uh, you know, we are. I'm actively engaged myself as a opinion leader in Japan, uh, talking about sustainability, energy security, and thanks to the Russian invasion to Ukraine, I'm very busy. Very good, and uh, <laughs> and it, it's an appropriate moment to offer condolences, even though it was now a few months ago, for the this tragic assassination of Shinzo Abe. Thank you very much, Michael. Yes, I miss him a lot. He is a very unique Japanese politician with global identity. He has so many friends in the global world, leaders everywhere. So many uh, you know, leaders uh, joined the... the uh, the state funeral for him. But, uh, you know, at this kind of situation, the very much crisis uh, in a geopolitical sense, 
he could have played a very important uh, intermediary for the discussion among the leaders. So I really miss him at this moment. Yeah, thank you for, for your condolences, Michael. The world certainly needs those figures which can bridge um, cultures like uh, Shinzo Abe. And in our world, you have certainly played that role. So uh, uh, I, for which I very much thank you. Um, <laughs> I would remind you the first time we actually, I think, met in person or really interacted was mm -hmm. the 2009 New Energy Finance. It was not Bloomberg at that time. It was New Energy That's Finance correct. Summit in, London, in the midst in of the crisis. And yeah, we yeah, yeah. had to downgrade the whole thing. We couldn't afford a big hotel and to do everything very plush. Mm -hmm. We were in a wine cellar, if you remember, in this strange location yeah. with arched mm -hmm. brick ceilings. And I was enormously mm -hmm. honored that you came over to London and you spoke at the New Energy Finance Summit. And, um, and yes. that was when we first met. I remember that. That was your uh, headquarter, right? Uh, the Bloomberg, head, uh, excuse me, New Energy Finance uh, office in London, I guess. Wasn't it the case? No, it was, a, it, it was a venue for rental. It was actually something called Vinopolis. Is that all? So I, oh, ah, that's okay. interesting. So, all these years, you thought we operated from a subterranean cellar. It wasn't quite as bad as that during the new energy true, finance. We true. did actually have a that's normal true. office, although it was incredibly cramped at that point. Yeah, I think uh, we, we we met there, and uh, we have often together at the World Economic Energy uh, World Economic Forum in Davos and discussing up sustainability issues. Uh, yeah, at the same time, well, so you know, this is uh, the long years of discussion of energy security uh, absolutely. and sustainability. And then and then, of course, um, as I transitioned out of the CEO role and became chair of Bloomberg New Energy Finance, you served on our mm -hmm. advisory board for a number of years. So uh, yeah, it's, it's truly an enormous. Uh, it's been a long history yeah. of interaction, all of it mm -hmm. very positive. What I would like to do is it, I want to start, if I could, on the mm -hmm. state of the world. And we've already touched on it. You've already mentioned the Russian invasion of Ukraine. There is this incredible mm -hmm. energy price spike, which was already starting at the at the, you know, as economies came out of the COVID lockdown, mm -hmm. we already saw the prices mm -hmm. going crazy. Have you ever seen in your time working on energy an analogous situation? How can we learn from yeah. history? Well, very good question, Michael. Um, I joined METI in 1973, when the first oil crisis happened. <laughs> Um, in Arab embargo of oil and oil price went very high. And, uh, you know, Japan was in, in the total panic about the short, possible shortage of the oil supply to us. We are so heavily dependent on oil um, at that time from, from uh, Middle East, especially. When I joined in, in Medi, the international uh, division or department, which take care of the uh, global issues, including energy, it was 1979. The second oil crisis happened. The Iranian uh, revolution happened and oil prices went very high, um, you know, almost uh, uh, triple from the level before that was, that disruption of oil was the largest in the history. And then when I joined IEA, it was uh, 2007, the oil price, uh, 2008, it's the oil price start rising to $147. It's not a crisis. In a way, uh, the supply disruption didn't happen, but because of the Chinese economic growth and the demand for oil uh, or energy is uh, rapidly growing and supply cannot match. So the price went as high as $147. And then suddenly the, uh, the Lehman, sh Lehman shock financial crisis happens and oil price went down toward $30 to the end of that year. So that, this up and down was enormous shock. But, uh, you know, current crisis is much more than that. Fatih Birol said it's not the oil crisis, but it's a first global energy crisis. The Fatih is right because it's not only uh, oil, oil shock or oil crisis which created IEA. It's not the only the coal. It's not only gas. It's it's electricity. 
So this is a total energy crisis, very complicatedly uh, connected, and the Russian invasion of Ukraine, of course, that triggered this crisis. The IA released stockpile of oil twice uh, after Ukraine uh, shock, but uh, that's the oil price, as you said, it's, it's getting higher. The gas prices went high even before the crisis. It's because of Russia. Russia tried to test the European resilience by you know, reducing the supply. And oil price, uh, gas price went very high just before his invasion. And uh, I think you know, the Crimea, uh, uh, invasion of Russia into the Crimea uh, in 2014 was the turning point because Europe suddenly reacted with sanctions, but that wasn't enough. Even after Crimean, uh, let's say, uh, yeah, integration to Russia, gas dependency of, of uh, Europe increases. And even after that, the discussion about, um, uh, let's say, the uh, 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 Nord Stream 2 will continue. So that, I mean, I think Europe sent a terrible message to Russia. This is a mistake of uh, Angela Merkel. And uh, she made uh, lots of mistakes, but this one with, uh, I mean, phase out the nuclear power after Fukushima and too much dependency on the gas from Russia and reducing coal, uh, of course, I mean, uh, it's, it's necessary politically at that moment, probably, but this triggered, her decision triggered this geological, uh, geographical, uh, uh, geopolitical crisis of the, current uh, situation. So we are now in a very difficult, uh, 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 let's say, a situation, especially Europe is suffering a lot because of the uh, facing the cold winter. Uh, does Europe has enough, uh, let's say, gas for the future? Because pipeline gas is very difficult to 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 to, to alleviate the, the, the alternative because there is no uh, LNG capacity is not enough. So how can Europe get uh, supply of gas uh, if uh, pipeline gas from Russia is, is, uh, is, is, is cannot come? So now Europe is agonizing. I, mean, I remember that I said golden age of natural gas is coming in 2011, thanks to the shale revolution of the North America. It, it happened. Um, but uh, maybe it's now the gas is uh, the golden age of not the natural gas, but golden age of LNG has happened thanks to the uh, to the Russian invasion. And uh, the thing is getting more interesting because a couple of days ago, IEA uh, World Energy Outlook 2022, that this year's Outlook says that golden age of natural gas is closing. This, this surprised me a lot. Very interesting. The price of gas is very high, but uh, because of uh, uh, the, 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 the acceleration of uh, Europe, uh, you know, moving away from gas from Russia means Russian, I would say, uh, importance in the gas trade will decline dramatically. The demand for gas, even may eventually uh, level off toward 2030 and uh, peak demand for total fossil oil, including oil, gas, and uh, uh, coal will be, let's say, uh, level off uh, or declining, uh, maybe even in a, in a few years time, uh, toward 2030, the peak of the fossil fuel will happen in, well, fam famous scenario of uh, stated policy scenario. That means a likely scenario will uh, tell us that the peak of fossil fuel is coming in very soon. So in a sense, I think, uh, you know, uh, 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 we are, I mean, this, energy crisis will probably subside when the Russian gas find an alternative destination by enhanced uh, you know, gas pipeline to, to China. 
and or more LNG facilities to move gas from Russia to Asia. You know, by these kind of things, maybe um, gas, uh, the energy uh, crisis will subside gradually in the next decade or so. But climate, uh, let's say, crisis together with the European independence from Russia will create a huge energy structural change. That is what even the turning point mentioning about the yeah. Russia or carbon dioxide or fossil fuel peak, you know, these things are happening uh, currently. That is the current IEA's analysis and I cannot agree more. This is a huge energy restructuring. You've just given a, um, a fantastic synopsis, um, not just of the IEA's uh, output, which, with which you agree, but also of my views. Uh, and I wrote something, uh, my most recent piece for Bloomberg, which was called mm -hmm. After Ukraine, The Great Clean Energy Acceleration. And actually mm -hmm. it was um, uh, released also on cleaning up uh, the, uh, as an audio episode. And it's exactly this scenario that what you've got is this very traumatic time with huge energy mm -hmm. prices, and it's very difficult um, uh, across Europe and even uh, beyond in terms of the impact on people who are more vulnerable and less wealthy. Uh, mm -hmm. But what you've got is now the energy trilemma, sustainability, mm -hmm. affordability of clean energy, mm -hmm. and now security, mm -hmm. all pushing right. in the same direction. And then we see these enormous... Um, programs of support in Europe, Fit for 55, Repower mm -hmm. EU, Hydrogen mm -hmm. Strategy. We see the Inflation Reduction Act in the US. And then in China, mm -hmm. we see plans to build enormous amounts of clean energy, India as well. And then mm -hmm. Japan, the Green Transformation Plan, the 1 trillion yeah. yen Green Transformation Plan, which mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. everything starts to kind of line up to accelerate yep. clean energy. Um, could you right. talk about the Japanese part of that matrix? Yeah, well, before going that, uh, let me say that uh, in this great competition of the global energy crisis and climate crisis, I think there will be winners and losers, Michael. Uh, and uh, Europe, as a leader of uh, this transformation, uh, and uh, really accelerated by uh, this uh, you know, Russian situation uh, to Ukraine. I think Europe can be winner. And also Europe is really putting the resources to that and also making a standard setting uh, because of this carbon border adjustment measures is forcing other countries to, to play the same rule, same game with Europe. So Europe can be good winner. And, and the United States, U.S. could be, because I am really surprised to see their new Inflation Reduction uh, Act and also Infrastructure Act gives a huge subsidy to the uh, CCS, for example, $85 per ton of CO2 for the CCS is amazing. And also uh, huge uh, support to the electric vehicle and, uh, and hydrogen infrastructures. Na you can name it. This is a really revolutionary um, uh, US activity. And uh, you know, th th I think this will make a big difference. And, and also US can be a winner because uh, the major megatech firms uh, trying to you know, uh, uh, decarbonize their operation totally, including the supply chain. Well, for example, Apple request uh, 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 announced that they are going to decarbonize carbon neutral by 2030, much earlier than the government's uh, claiming 2050 as target. And all the supply chain companies are requested to do the same. Uh, uh, so the Sony, or I mean, I, I was told that there are more than 200 companies accept uh, the, the Apple's request to go renewable energy 100%, and among them, 28 Japanese companies, famous Sony, uh, Murata, or uh, let's say Kyoksha, that, that's a Toshiba's a semiconductor company. Uh, they have to they have to live with these uh, let's say requests if they want to continue in the supply chain to apple so this demand side uh let's say uh driven 
transformation is happening, uh, led by the American company, uh, the auto, auto sector to do the same, Mercedes or GM, they are forcing the same thing. Japan is not yet going that far, yeah, the Toyota, but this, uh, this leads the US, they are definitely the winner. And yeah. China, we'll see, because China so tried the, to the make, make it a kind of renewable superpower, you know, yeah. natural energy superpower. So Xi Jinping tried to his best to make it. I don't know if it works or not, but, but they may try their best. So if Japan can compete with these countries, I mean, even Saudi Arabia try to use the, you know, their renewables and also the CCS and to make uh, their oil or gas for the blue hydrogen or blue ammonia. So they are trying to avoid the stranded acetization of their natural resources. So uh, good luck, but they are try trying with these new technologies. So how Japan can compete with these countries? That is the question. And th that is what <laughs> I try to prescribe now because Japan started hydrogen economy when Toyota Mirai is, is coming to the road in 2014. And we discussed a lot about hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen at that time. And, but probably we focus too much on the transportation or, or uh, let's say high, a fuel cell vehicle Mirai and how to add the number of the uh, refueling station. But the number of the cars, I mean, the Mirai is not increasing. It's at, at this moment, it's about 20,000 uh, Mirai and 159 refueling station. But that's too small for the uh, hydrogen economy really materialize. It sh we should go, Toyota should go to the you know, commercial fleet of taxis, vans, trucks, or buses, which China did. And but, China, but China can, can overtook I, us. But can I come in and because- Europe, you, yes, there's Europe, a couple of, there's Europe a lot- overtook us by the industry, <laughs> industrial- Tanaka, so there's so much going and on there. You came to the US. Wonder, I, yeah, I, I want to come in because there's so much going sure, on there. Go ahead. You're raising so many questions. Yes. And I want to sort of, mm -hmm. I want to, uh, um, because when you get when you get onto fuel cell vehicles, it's a mm -hmm. it's a completely different discussion. Because most of the rest of the world has figured out that they're not going to happen. Taxis, vans, buses, because it's you know it, it, it's it's such a. Uh, but but then we get go down the hydrogen sort of rabbit hole, which I think maybe we'll do a little bit later. I want to come back to this mm -hmm. question of competition between the blocks, yeah. if I might, just before mm -hmm. we get onto mm -hmm. some of the sort of sectoral sure. stuff, because. Mm -hmm. You know, the paradigm that we've spent the last 20 years in is we must address climate change. It's a global problem. Therefore, we must cooperate. Therefore, right. we must cooperate. The way to do mm -hmm. this is mm -hmm. the UN FCCC. The way to do this is the Clean mm -hmm. Energy Ministerial. The way to do this is all has mm -hmm. to be hand in hand cooperation. But what you've outlined is maybe mm -hmm. an I, I, I put this out as a thesis for the audience and for us. Are we mm -hmm. entering a period where we're going to address climate change really through two different things, which is competition, great block competition, right. Europe, US, mm -hmm. Asia, or Asia maybe mm -hmm. broken into different, um, different countries, um, and also through the integration of the supply chain. So the combination mm -hmm. of competition and supply right. chain pressures achieving what, frankly, mm -hmm. 20 years of diplomacy, in fact, 30 or 40 years of diplomacy mm -hmm. has really mm -hmm. failed to do. Right. Yeah, well, very important point, Michael, because uh, I remember that uh, when I, back in IEA and I participated in, in many meetings, like even a G7 I mean, summit meeting uh, in Hokkaido, and uh, uh, there was the, the invitation, uh, the, it was the Prime Minister Fukuda that was a chair. And uh, George Bush was there, Sarkozy was there, Merkel was there, and they invited uh, the Chinese leader, Fu Jintao, the former uh, uh, General Secretary. And he mentioned to us in the meeting that, uh, you know, they are trying to use as renewable energy as possible. Yes, because uh, you know, it is necessary, but they are doing it not for the global 
community or no global you know, sustainability. They do it for energy security and efficiency of the economy. So I was really surprised. Uh, and it is quite clever to say that to reduce the dependency of oil and gas and imported oil and gas, replacing it by more indigenous uh, renewable energy make very good sense for energy security, even at that time. So the game is now starting much more obvious and conspicuous because of the uh, Russian invasion to Ukraine. Now we try to use indigenous energy sources like uh, renewables together with nuclear for the sake of energy security. And this trend is much more strengthened thanks to the Russian invasion and thanks to the great competition between nations, US, China, US, Russia, etc. So Europe is now make a good alliance and make a one unified energy market covering gas, oil, together with renewables and grid connectivity, gas pipeline, and making a unified policy of carbon pricing and forcing others to do the same. So this standardization of Europe in terms of sustainability and the security is a really great power to make other countries to do the same. Japan is isolated out, unfortunately. You know, we try to make the leadership in, in hydrogen, but not really because we are overtaken by China, overtaken by Europe, and now we are going to be overtaken by United States. Can we really much, but what Japan is now trying to do, I go back to your original question, is that we have to make, again, investing into the new technologies of hydrogen to the industrial sector, just like Europe yep. is doing in the steel making or cement and uh, by uh, co-firing clean ammonia to the coal power plant or gas turbine with clean hydrogen and making a global supply chain of hydrogen or ammonia. Japan started you know, liquid, you know, liquid, liquid, you know? liquid natural gas 50 years ago. Now we are yeah. trying to build the hydrogen supply right. uh, in, as soon as possible. That's what the Japanese policy is all about now. Yeah, but can I come in on that? Because I'm doing a lot of work sure. on hydrogen transportation. Okay. And there's a fundamental problem. And I and I want to know whether you whether you sort sure. of uh, what, how, how do you how do you deal with this? Because the mm -hmm. problem with importing hydrogen is mm -hmm. because of the physics of hydrogen. It's mm -hmm. probably three to five times as expensive as LNG, right? Very Correct. simple. Liquid hydrogen what? is three times mm -hmm. the volume um, of, mm -hmm. of LNG, right? Uh, in fact, mm -hmm. it's even more than that. So. Um, Instead of having, if you have one Qmax, one big LNG carrier, you're going to need for the same amount of energy, three hydrogen carriers, liquid hydrogen carriers. True. And mm -hmm. liquefying hydrogen means that you've already wasted two Qmaxes liquefying it. You've then wasted another two Qmaxes turning True. it from electricity into hydrogen. Mm -hmm. Then mm -hmm. you've got boil off, the fact that when it's that cold, you have hydrogen that's being lost during the journey. And then mm -hmm. you want to get it, 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 that's fine. If you want to use the hydrogen as heat, you get that hydrogen higher heat value, you get to use it. But if you mm -hmm. want to use that hydrogen then to power your grid, you then have more loss because you turn the hydrogen back into, uh, into electricity, True. which of course you would have with LNG as well. But yeah, the, yeah. And then you can say, oh, well, we're going to do liquid uh, organic um, mm -hmm. storage yeah. of hydrogen for imports. Mm -hmm. Forget it. Yeah. It's just as bad as, as liquid hydrogen because it only has 54, 60 kilos per cubic meter of, of hydrogen. So my mm -hmm. worry, let me turn this into a question. Are you worried sure. that you mm -hmm. can do ammonia importation and then you mm -hmm. can co-fire it with your coal but it's going to generate, mm -hmm. Bloomberg says, $260 per megawatt hour electricity. You can import mm -hmm. liquid hydrogen. You can import liquid oxide, uh, liquid organic uh, compounds with hydrogen. But mm -hmm. fundamentally, you're going to make Japan's energy three to five times higher right. than its competitors. Then, 
Do you agree with that? And if so, yeah, how well, do you compete? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that is, you, you're right. At this moment, the price of uh, you know clean hydrogen or ammonia is very expensive. So can we can Japan compete? Well, I mean, if we replace the current uh, energy by these high uh, you know uh, resources, no way. How Japan start uh, liquid natural gas importation? Because 50 years ago, the liquid natural gas cost very high because it's the first stage uh, initial investment was huge. But Japan started it to replace uh, old gas uh, with cleaner uh, source as LNG. And 50 years, uh, and then we built a big power, I mean, the transportation vessel. Uh, we started uh, this technology. And Japan can do that because the, even with this high cost, you know, Japan has, um, let's say, a regulated market of electricity and gas. So, so, so we, uh, accommodate these high prices in the industrial competitiveness. Um, and gradually the volume of the trade increase. So the cost of uh, LNG or, uh, is getting uh, lower and lower. Of course, still LNG is expensive relative to, to gas, uh, get pipeline gas. So uh, we have uh, certainly suffer still Japanese cost of electricity is much higher than other OECD countries, for example. But uh, we are covering it by the competitiveness of the industry by other, other elements. Can we start uh, like this for hydrogen or ammonia or, 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 or you know, MCH? Uh, this is our great trial i mean we need uh, can, the you know contract for difference type of arrangement yeah. by uh, by by uk or we need the h2 global type of uh, procurement policy of the germany some kind of uh, you know uh, deployment subsidy is definitely necessary i mean that is what now yeah. making is can I, considering tanaka san i i'm the biggest believer in the world in experience curves and in cost reductions but the physics of hydrogen, you can't get round. The density of hydrogen is the density <laughs> well, of hydrogen. So, you, and here, I know, you... I know. But, 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 Michael, I mean, if we have to move to the hydrogen economy for the sake of, uh, um, you know, sustainability, I think uh, there's no other way that the cost well, of carbon will be high enough to legitimize the use of hydrogen. Nobody well, will on, except use that, except that there are alternatives. Yeah, I know. I mean, you, you know, so so I think, uh, you know, renewable will generate green hydrogen as such. So the, 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 the marginal cost of renewable is zero. So eventually, the marginal cost of gas or marginal cost of uh, fossil fuel should be zero to compete with green hydrogen. So the gas is very high at this moment, but if nobody buy it, um, because of this uh, carbon uh, decarbonization, I think gas or oil or coal has no value as such. But it is it could be valued when uh, you know uh, with, with CCS blue hydrogen yeah. has a value. So this kind of uh, uh, situation will come by the let's say co with the competition to the green hydrogen from the electri electrolyzer. So I think this is a great, great transformation. Um, and and uh, what uh, oil producing countries or gas producing can uh, take care of this is selling the service of CCS. I mean, they take out the carbon dioxide and put it back to the oil and gas field. And this has a value. The gas inside the you know, well do not have any value, but taking out CO2 and put it back to that well has a value. So CCS has a value. So what this is the way for the oil producing country can survive. <laughs> so this is when the real decarbonization or carbon neutral world happens. And that is a new value system. In that kind of situation, I think carbon, I mean, hydrogen may, have a huge way of uh, the fuel and could help the electricity. I mean, if, I think 
electricity, renewable electricity could be much more competitive, but uh, you know, exporting renewable energy, maybe hydrogen is, is the possible, uh, let's say, uh, way. And uh, Japan needs, I mean, our renewable energy situation is not so strong. Um, we are trying to increase as much as possible still our power market structure prohibit the expansion of, uh, uh, of these uh, renewable energy. So I am arguing for the sake of competition domestically in, in Japan with renewable energy, imported green hydrogen or green ammonia or blue ammonia or blue hydrogen may really help us to achieve that. I don't know if this goes or not, but this yeah. is the kind of, carbon neutral world of energy if it happens. No, I, I think what, what's fascinating there is this the assumption that um, it's the only way, that the hydrogen is the only route or largely the only route for Japan. But then you came back to talk about the renewable. And I, and I don't know if you've seen my hydrogen ladder. You know, I believe mm -hmm. that hydrogen, clean hydrogen, blue and green, will be used for industrial processes, feedstocks, and so on. I have no belief that hydrogen will be used in uh, land transportation, space heating, even industrial heat, and uh, certainly bulk power generation. It's so uncompetitive. Mm. And, you know, I, but, but, but I do but, think but, it Michael, will play but, a role but, but, in Michael. long duration storage. So lots yes, of yes. renewables. Mm -hmm. Japan can do huge mm. amounts of floating offshore wind for sure, and right, probably right. much more geothermal but then maybe mm -hmm. the hydrogen is needed for long duration storage. So when there's no wind, that's then you have true. to have something and it doesn't matter what it costs that's at true. that point. It's especially for the storage, uh, uh, let's say uh, liquid orga I mean, uh, organic substance like MCH uh, could help because MCH is uh, liquid under normal pressure and uh, normal temperature. Yeah. So that it can be stored in a t in the oil tank or oil, oil tanker. Yeah. So oil will no, no longer be the, let's say, uh, uh, in the net zero world, oil trade will be declined substantially. So there are plenty of oil the tanks or oil field be kind of uh, empty. So uh, MCH, could replace oil as a strategic stockpile for the security uh, because uh, it, it's normal uh, oil, I mean, liquid in under you know, current temperature or pressure. So storage sake, yes, hydrogen is very good, but, but uh, Michael, one way to use hydrogen is going through the pipeline. I think Germany is thinking about uh, a hydrogen pipeline as a kind of back yeah. <laughs> backdrop or you know uh, let's say yeah, uh, the second and network the, after the grid line and right but by the, but that only uh, makes pipe, sense pipe, 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 pipeline hydrogen can generate heat and electricity with a stationary uh, fuel cell and if yeah, no, that technology but, moves ahead, the, that is a the way right but the, the problem with the pipeline the pipeline is great as long as what you need out the other end is hydrogen. If what mm -hmm. if the homework question, and this is where you know where it comes to for Germany, if you've got lots of renewable energy in North Africa, mm -hmm. right? You've got cheap wind, cheap solar, and you need mm -hmm. renewable energy in Germany. The problem is yeah. that you by the time you go from wind and solar to hydrogen to the pipeline and then back in the fuel cell. And by the way, I'm an investor in X Links. I did a fabulous episode mm -hmm. with the CEO, that's Moroccan wind and solar and a few batteries into the UK, mm -hmm. affordable, half the price of nuclear, frankly. And I'm also an investor in series power, which is exactly that fuel cell, which can turn the hydrogen mm. back into power. Okay. The, the problem is the cycle efficiency is so low that high voltage DC beats the pipeline for electricity. But okay. I, I, let me just switch to one other area, which is very concerning to me for countries like Germany, um, the UK, mm -hmm. Japan, Korea. You, if you start importing hydrogen for the steel industry, then mm -hmm. what we're really saying is we're going to import already the ore, the iron ore, 
Then we're going to True. import this very mm -hmm. expensive hydrogen for the steel industry. Yeah, right? yes, yes, yes. And then we're going to make That's, this very yeah, expensive I, steel I, in I, competition yes, I, with Brazil. I agree. In competition yes, with I Australia, agree. maybe. I agree. In competition agree. with China. Yeah. And this is you clean very steel. Good point. That, yeah, yeah. This, they'll be making clean steel. Good you can't keep very it out with point. a carbon border adjustment. Yes. Yes, yes. Nippon Steel Corporation thinking about investing into Australia, where they have the very clean uh, hydrogen or clean, uh, let's say, uh, electricity, as well yep. as iron ore. So it's much better for them to invest into Australia and bring back or import back the green steel. That's true. That's true. So can we continue to maintain that the steel industry in Japan? This is a huge question under the you know, carbon neutral world. Can we do that? Because Japan lost aluminum industry totally because of the very high electricity price. We had the very good smelters of aluminum before, but if they gone, totally we disappear. The aluminum industry some time ago, the same thing could happen to steel industry. Then can we continue as an industrial state as such, or just we can we lose all the steel industry? Can we maintain the auto company? Maybe, maybe not. Or we are moving to the service industry as such. This is a really challenging thing for the industrial strategy of Japan. You're right. I had uh, Patrick Greichen on cleaning up, and I asked him the same question about um, uh, about deindustrialization, and he said, uh, and we talked about the fact that all these energy models, including the IEA models, they sort of assume that energy demand continues. You know, it's kind of correct. extrapolated out. What those That's models correct. don't do is say, well, mm -hmm. all the steel industry might go to countries which are what I call renewable energy superpowers. Exactly. And there might yeah, be yeah, huge yeah. changes right. in the location right. of industry. That's mm -hmm. not modeled. Yeah, exactly. I agree with you. I mean, uh, we need, I mean, this kind of big uh, global industrial restructuring may happen. Thanks, because of this climate shock. Yes, you're right. So then let me ask a question about what a politician should do. What should we be saying? What would you say to um, your prime minister uh, about the risks associated with the hydrogen mm -hmm. strategy? Mm -hmm. Well, hydrogen strategy, well, we have to, I mean, uh, as for the hydrogen strategy, we have to make the, you know, uh, total, uh, as much as possible, reduce the cost of renewable energy. I mean, in Japan, by total restructure of the power market, for example, we have the nine regional monopolies who do not want the competition among each other. So they separate the grid lines and much less connectivity among each other. So this is a problem for Japan to expand the uh, use of renewables, for example. So this kind of very uh, dynamic, drastic, uh, market change is necessary for the power sector. The gas sector, for example, is asking for the so-called methanation. I mean, the kind of uh, the synthetic gas uh, with recycled carbon. Uh, they are thinking because this is the only way to use their infrastructure, current infrastructure. But it doesn't make sense because if nobody is emitting carbon dioxide in 2050, how could we recycle the carbon? Yeah. I mean, there could be clean hydrogen, but there is no carbon. So they say, well, Mr. Tanaka, we will do the direct air capture. How can we do that very high cost of renewable energy in, uh, in Japan? They say, well, we will go to the direct air capture in Saudi Arabia, Australia. So, so in that case, this is nonsense, right? So there are lots of nonsense stories about uh, the, you know, uh, or, uh, or uh, what's the ideas we have. So we have to change our mindset and uh, try to restructure the big energy vision, including the nuclear power. I mean, you mentioned about yeah. nuclear, Shida-san is trying to restart it, that's fine. But we need a good I want vision, to come back. sustainable if I nuclear you, is different. Sure. Can I, let, let's come on to nuclear because um, yeah. nobody has worked harder, I don't think, in Japan or globally on the bounce back after the Fukushima disaster, the Fukushima accident, mm -hmm. 
uh, than you. You have been the leading voice, at least in my view, saying, yeah. you know, we have to get the nuclear back online. We cannot, there right. are no alternatives. There are no sensible alternatives mm -hmm. for that amount of clean exactly. electricity in Japan. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It also relates, I also thought, by the way, just as an aside, um, when Fukushima happened, I thought that that might be the spur for the restructuring that you talked about of the nine sort of monopoly areas of mm -hmm. the power right. grids in I Japan. And I'm yes, very disappointed exactly. that we're mm -hmm. now, 11 years later, still talking about that same issue. Um, <laughs> yes, but unfortunately. Talk, talk, talk to me about, or talk to us about the, yeah. where does nuclear sit in Japan? Is the public now on board with a large scale return uh -huh. of the remaining plants? I don't know how many, you've got a few mm -hmm. plants working, still a lot in mothball. Where is society? Where is the sector? Good point. Um, Michael, we have three, 33 reactors uh, operable, and ab ab out of that, uh, uh, 17 uh, reactors are already given a license to restart. Uh, oh, uh, among them, 10 uh, restarted um, in these two, three years. Um, and Kishida-san announced recently that we have to restart these 17 already licensed reactors to the end of next year. Public opinion of restarting is uh, very positive. Um, I think there is about 60% of population is supporting restarting. Uh, this is really amazing. I mean, after Fukushima, uh, the support for the nuclear power never goes 50, more than 50%. But because of this Ukraine situation, Japanese public think nuclear is very important for the energy security. And, and also the shortage of electricity was experienced uh, because of the, you know, uh, in March or in, 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 uh, before summer this year, very hot time and Tokyo Electric may almost have a shortage and a blackout could have happened. So the shortage because of the Russian situation, we may lose the gas from Sakhalin and then, uh, you know, who knows, the blackout could happen. So nuclear is a very important to maintain the security supply. So that, that is fine, but can we, replacing is fine, maybe extending the life of these reactors also fine, from 40 years to 60, uh, you know, just as it happened in UK or US, Japan is thinking about extension of life. But replacing the old reactor but with the new one, building the new reactor is still very high hurdle because of the you know the utilities has a, a private contract with governors of the host uh, community and with, uh, without permission or okay from governor, we cannot build any nuclear reactor. We cannot restart any nuclear reactor. So to convince the governors, we need the different narrative than only the safety or only carbon dioxide reduction, emission reduction. The sustainability of the nuclear power in Japan after Fukushima, there are three additional conditions. That's what I mentioned. The first one is safety, of course, and minimizing the risk because the current big light water reactor paradigm has a problem because after Fukushima, um, you know, no, I mean, there's a, I mean, it's obvious we have a big risk and the evacuation of 20 kilometers radius in certain places is impossible. So we have to move from the big large reactor, uh, light water reactor paradigm to the small modular reactor. We can uh, restrict the evacuation zone within a plant or one, two kilometers radius. That, if that's possible, it's much easier to convince public that the safety, uh, let's say, concern should be accommodated. The second condition is the high level waste disposal. Without the concrete program for that, public will not accept. Uh, the France has bill, the Finland has uh, Oncalo, we don't have any good idea where to dispose the high level waste. So without clear, let's say technology to reduce the toxicity or reduce the volume of the waste and convince the, some localities to take care of the waste. I mean, I think no way to proceed to that next generation. 
The third condition is the proliferation risk. After Ukraine, small countries or non-weapon states want to have a weapon, not only North Korea or Iran. To have a weapon is the best defense against Russia, against China. So to make the nuclear power, Saudi Arabia wants to have a nuclear power because Iran could have a weapon. So this proliferation risk is so easy. And especially the big light water reactor is very proliferation prone because they need, this system needs enrichment and to reduce the uh, waste, the pro, uh, reprocessing is the way to produce plutonium. So light water reactor has a you know, genuine risk of proliferation. So I am arguing maybe we should forget about this large light water reactor paradigm, but move to the small modular fast reactor, which can take care of the waste, which can take care of the risk of proliferation and small enough to minimize the risk. And these are the three additional questions. And small reactor is very much easy to change the operation uh, level and, and stop and go, stop and go. So that means it is much easier and friendly to coexist with uh, renewable energy sources in the locality. So it's more of a decentralized system and more flexible use of the nuclear uh, by the small size is the way. And the cost, and people say, big light water reactor guys say that the cost of small modular is too high. I don't think so. The cost of big light water reactor is too high. The history shows in Bogu of the Georgia, United States, uh, in, in the Framand Bill of, U, uh, of France, or Kiloto of, in Finland, yeah, the cost is three times, three times more than originally planned because of the extension, because of the uh, strength and uh, safety regulation, you name it. The light, old, big light water reactor is too costly and cannot build, uh, you know, more. <laughs> Maybe Japan can build another one or two, but to spend trillions of yen for just for two, one or two reactor doesn't make any sense. So go to the new system, which is more sustainable and put money into it. Otherwise, there's no future for nuclear power. That is what I'm saying. Are there companies in Japan working on the small modular reactors? Is that an active program? Yeah, they, it's very active in the UK, very active in the US. I know China, India, and others. Yeah, Jap Japanese companies have some design, that, but not any of them are really engaged themselves to, to develop the, the technology. They have the ideas, and they are interested in if the trend is moving that way. But uh, still they think some improved big light water reactor is easy to the business. So Mitsubishi and Kansai Electric, they try to you know, convince public this is the way because this is easy. But there is no easy future for the nuclear power. This is a difficult sector. So without changing drastically, the narrative and technology and innovation, no way for the future. I created in the Canon uh, Institute of Global Studies, the panel with only women, except me, and let them discuss about the future vision of the nuclear power for Japan. If these ladies accept the future of the nuclear power, then we can sell it to the public probably. The men in the nuclear sector or nuclear village it's too conservative and they don't have any guts to break up that old concept and start a new one. So I think women should be promoted in Japan for the politics, for the government, for the private sector, but especially for the nuclear power. I believe that if the president of the Tokyo Electric at 2011, she could have avoided that tragic accident because women is much more concerned about safety and security. So I am testing this hypothesis and I'm very much convinced if Tokyo Electric really wants to restart nuclear power plant in Kashiwazaki and Kariwa, make the president a woman and move the headquarter to that village. And then governor of Niigata will accept to restart the nuclear power for, for TEPCO. 
very interesting what you say there because um, I've had two nuclear experts on cleaning up, Kirsty Gogan and Julia Pike, both brilliant and both women. Um, there's somebody else that we're going to really? get on at some point, Isabel Bomeke from uh, uh, Brazil. And all together in this climate and energy leadership space, incredible numbers of impressive women. Women have certainly you know, yeah. showed their mettle yes. um, throughout, yes. whether it's the climate negotiations, uh, whether it's in yes. finance, uh, and in fact, also te uh, technology. Um, we just had a fantastic episode with an expert Great. on industrial heat, Sylvia Madedu. Mm -hmm. um, we've had uh, a biotechnologist, Jennifer Holmgren. So uh, I'm with you. Yeah. I definitely think we need to give the microphone more to yes. the women. This innovation for Kulas Forum found that about two years ago, that there's a positive correlation between climate change mitigation and gender balance in countries, in the business, etc. So promoting gender balance means much better sustainability for the future. Absolutely. I want to finish, if I might, by asking you about that forum. Sure. Um, and you've got, there's a really key word in there, which is innovation. And that's something Correct. that you have been um, very consistently supportive of, even when you talk about nuclear, mm -hmm. you talk about it has to be the new because it solves problems. You talk about the hydrogen, we have to get the costs down. It is uh, with direct air capture. So innovation has been a huge theme of all of your work. What are you doing with that forum? Correct. Give us a plug just to finish this fabulous conversation. Thank you very much, Michael, for inviting me. This Innovation Coolers Forum, uh, in short, ICEF, has created by the late Prime Minister Abe, and he believes that innovation is necessary for the technology. So many new technology like uh, you know, recycling, carbon recycling, um, and also renewable energies, hydrogen, DAC, um, and, 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 and emission, uh, but not only technology, but policy is also uh, need innovation. The regulation is back to uh, back to the technological innovation. So, without change in the system, this innovation cannot really materialize and the, uh, uh, and the deployment of new system. So, uh, innovation of uh, regulation is one thing. I mean, this uh, the power market uh, regulation is definitely the one of them, which I try my best. All hydrogen, the safety uh, regulation for hydrogen must be uh, reviewed to make hydrogen economy possible. So government policy should be innovative. And I'm, I'm now very much surprised to find many discussion here. And even the Fatih Bureau is saying that we need new industrial policy. Industrial policy is a very much dirty word when I was in the United States for the trade negotiation. Japan, Japanese Medi is using this industrial policy and making Japan is uh, made a very strong competitive country. So this is exactly the reason for the Japanese competitiveness and we should stop it by the market economy. That is what US trade policy was all about. But now the story is very different. For the sake of sustainability and uh, decarbonization, we need a very strong industrial policy uh, of uh, you know, subsidy for the electric vehicle, uh, tax credit for CCS, hydrogen infrastructure building. This is the huge industrial policy for the sustainability at the time of uh, great competition. And, uh, I think Russia is least prepared for this big shock because uh, you know technology is now moving out from west. It's uh, sanction stops it coming in. The investment is moving out. Uh, uh, they need huge money for continuing the war, and brain drain is happening. So Russia is least prepared for this competition, and Japan should learn the lesson that we need the strong in innovative uh, industrial policy to be back as a winner in this game. And hydrogen is a test. And the nuclear uh, sector revitalization is a test for us. Yeah. That is my message in, in this ISEF meeting um, about a month ago. That's 
fascinating, uh, particularly putting it in the context of the history of METI and your own um, bio, your own uh, career, because, of course, my view of why we don't like industrial strategy in the Anglo-Saxon word world is because we were really bad at it. You know, we didn't do METI <laughs> and become brilliantly competitive. What we did was British Leyland and Minitel and, you know, all sorts of um, failed industrial strategies. And then it, we do have, to be fair, the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, Bays. So it's kind of coming back into fashion uh, even here. Uh, and we had um, on that, if any listeners are interested, we had a, a fascinating session of cleaning up with Mariana Mazzucato, who's the, um, the, the, the lefty economist who's been pushing industrial mm -hmm. strategy very hard uh, through the corridors of power, in, certainly in Europe. Um, but I need to thank you for the time that you spent with us. It has been absolutely fascinating. It's always a great pleasure to see you. And I wish you the best of luck with your forum. Thank you very much, Michael. I will keep in touch with you. And this is a very in interesting moment. And uh, I, 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 I may have spoke too much. I spoke too much. But uh, well, I, I really appreciate uh, you provide me the opportunity to tell you about what I'm thinking, what I'm doing back in Japan. Thank you, Michael. Very good. It's always a pleasure to listen to you. Thanks very much, uh, Tanaka-san. Thank you. So that was Nobuo Tanaka, former executive director of the International Energy Agency and a major thought leader on Japan's net zero transition and the energy sector worldwide. My guest next week is another alumnus of the International Energy Agency. It's Laszlo Varro, who was their chief economist. He's now the VP for the Global Business Environment at Shell. So please join me at this time next week for Cleaning Up, with Laszlo Varro. Cleaning Up is brought to you by Capricorn Investment Group, the Liebreich Foundation, and the Gilardini Foundation.